Cyrus, you have, before we do anything, this is what I want. First, let me ask you this. How is your family? Uh, my family is doing fantastic. How about your own? As far as is the, uh, the coronavirus, everything okay? Yeah, I think once my parents could figure out who was allowed to go to Publix when uh, before <laughs> contaminated the household, and my sister, uh, she's a doctor now, and making sure that her uh, medical practice was up and running safely. Everyone's everyone's doing all right. Thank she's you for a psychiatrist, me. right? Yeah, exactly. She's a psychiatrist. Great. Yes. Great. Okay, Cyrus, this is what I want you to do. Bring us up to date from the time you left the school, what school you went to, what college, what you did. Bring us up to date what you have done, your life and everything, okay? Because right. people are interested. People in your class are going to be very interested. Okay? Uh, so after uh, graduating from the day school, I went to Andover, um, uh, actually very much on your own recommendation. When I was considering what high school I wanted to go to, I remember you had told me uh, that uh, there were select few high schools that I should be looking at. I ended up going to Andover and loving it. Uh, it was a transform transformative experience. Uh, I was there from 10th grade to 12th grade. Uh, for college, uh, you know, I was um, very interested in, in getting my career started in business as quickly as possible. So I decided to go undergraduate business. Uh, I went to the Wharton School for college, uh, where I studied finance and entrepreneurship. Uh, and after I graduated from college, I actually decided uh, it was in 1998 and there were a number of, it was a very hot time in the economy, lots of different opportunities. And uh, a lot of my colleagues were going to invest in banking or consulting. And I decided to go work for a guy named uh, Joe Lemont, who at the time was the Mark Zuckerberg of the late nineties in Austin, Texas for a software company called Trilogy Software. And uh, I worked there uh, uh, initially um, uh, basically just doing business development, uh, helping grow uh, that software company. And then I left to start my first software company in, 90, uh, in the late, I guess, 99, uh, which was a, a company short-lived called One Size Too Small. In the very early days of e-commerce, we made software for e-commerce companies. And uh, then the e-commerce bubble burst, and every e-commerce company that was not named Amazon went out of business. Uh, and my, uh, my software company shortly followed afterwards. So I was then 25 years old as a uh, sort of unemployed, uh, not successful CEO. And uh, at the, uh, despite my, my mother's um, insistence that I apply to law school, I decided to apply to business school. Uh, I then went to Columbia Business School. So I moved to New York. Um, I hit my application, send in my application on September 11th, 2001, at 7.30 in the morning, 30 minutes before my, the Twin Towers fell. Oh, my goodness. And uh, I remember my father and I were eating breakfast, and he told me, as we were watching what was going on on CNN, he said, uh, I'm not a religious man, but perhaps if you, uh, if you get in, uh, you shouldn't go to New York. <laughs> So I ended up moving in January of 2002 to New York City, um, and I've been here ever since. So for 18 years, I've now lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else. I went to Columbia Business School, uh, loved, loved the city. Uh, after that, I joined McKinsey and Company. So I did my stint as a consultant where I helped companies um, in healthcare and technology. And I had a specific focus on new product development. Uh, about uh, three and a half years into my uh, tenure at McKinsey, I was flying across the country and uh, flying from Seattle to New York. I had a really bad sinus infection. So my plane landed in New York and I ruptured an eardrum and I needed to find an ENT doctor. And as you know, everyone in my family is a doctor and I'm, I'm the one that wasn't really good at science. And so I ended up not being one. And I thought for sure uh, I should be able to find an uh, ENT physician in New York. And I, I went to my insurance company's website, as most people would do. And I started calling down the list of, of doctors. Uh, and I was calling doctors who were no longer practicing, who were no longer accepting my insurance. And in one case, I called a doctor who was deceased. And I thought to myself, this is the tool that I have in order to access healthcare. And it ended up taking me four days to get access to a specialist. 
And just growing up with, with a father who's a physician, I always had specialists that were sort of uh, always available to us. So it was a really, it was a really, um, uh, I guess, uh, eye-opening experience. And I just thought to myself that everything on, was being done on the internet, from ordering engagement rings to buying your underwear. Uh, why could I not book a doctor's appointment as easily as I could book everything else? So I, I uh, left my job at McKinsey and I started uh, a company called ZocDoc uh, with the goal of improving access to healthcare in America. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, my, my prior experience of being an entrepreneur was not a successful one. So this is my second time back in the saddle and it was uh, quite intimidating. But we uh, you know, basically spent three and a half years uh, trying to demonstrate that the business had a reason to exist. And uh, then after, after about 2010, after we uh, demonstrated that we could make the product work in New York City, that we could make it work beyond our initial specialty, which was dentistry, we could make it work with primary care doctors. I remember uh, I was getting some uh, criticism from investors because we, we'd just gone through the financial crisis and there was not, uh, the capital markets were not open to startups raising more money. And I needed, uh, I needed to raise uh, some additional capital to demonstrate that I could get ZocDoc to work uh, outside of New York. And I didn't really have capital available to me. So I entered a competition with Forbes magazine, uh, what was called Forbes Boost Your Business. And we got to uh, basically, it was like American Idol for startups. And the startup company would win 100, whoever won would win $100,000. And we ended up winning, um, because I did my entire company pitch and rhyme. <laughs> and, and I think people just thought it was weird enough and funny enough that we ended up winning that, that money and we were able to then expand my company to Washington DC. And then it was very clear that it was something that would work across the country. So for the next, uh, the next six years, we raised a quarter billion dollars and we expanded the company all across the US uh, in 50 different medical specialties in every single state in America. And uh, we do everything now from uh, enabling people to book marriage counseling to booking circumcisions all online or through mobile apps. Um, and in New York City, where I still live, I think one in every five new patient doctor relationships now originates on ZocDoc. So I ran that company for about a decade. And, um, and then I, uh, uh, I, I over, over that time period, you know, I, I finally got the for my entire life, I was always, um, always, I guess, delaying gratification, not really enjoying the moment. And I, I took, uh, it took a brief period where I started to really um, see what life, what life would be like in, in, for people that perhaps took other paths. Uh, and I, I, I did that and, and realized that I, uh, I don't like rosé, and I just really like uh, building things and helping people. And so I started uh, meeting and spending time with entrepreneurs to helping them build their own businesses. And I, I met maybe 300 companies in New York City over a, a few year period when I was running StockDoc. And then I, um, I ended up investing in five of them and then four of my five ended up hitting out of the park. So I got very, very lucky. And from that, I developed my own venture capital fund. So I now invest in startups that are doing, it's called my, my venture capital funds called Ambition. Uh, we invest in entrepreneurs that are both humble and ambitious and that are really trying to do world positive things. Uh, so we, uh, I, I do that uh, uh, for part of my time. Uh, for other part of my time, I have a new startup that I've created that is um, trying to solve an ancient problem, uh, which is the problem of lost. So lost, everything, lost people, lost objects, lost pets. Um, it started, uh, I met a few years back an artist um, named Brad Kunkel who had lost his puppy named Shadow. And they're in a birthday party in the spring of 2015. And there was some loud music and uh, he got, uh, his dog got spooked and ran away. And he spends the next month looking for his dog. He goes to all these animal shelters, prints out all these flyers, and he sort of sees the good and the bad of humanity. The good being that total strangers dropped everything they were doing and they, uh, they, uh, they helped him. And the bad being that total strangers tried to do things like lure him to a park, to mug him for the reward money, 
And uh, when I heard his story, I, I met him when he was about a month into his search and he was going to give up. And I ultimately, uh, uh, I was very moved. I think one of the earliest memories I had was when my dog Natasha ran away when I was five years old and got hit by a car. And I was very moved by his story and I told him I didn't know what I was going to do, but we were going to find his dog. And then nine days later we did. Uh, so she'd been missing for 39 days and she was at the, literally um, lost in this park in Brooklyn and, and roaming around. And it was this like, very epic story where uh, he had, she had had to be trapped in the end. But needless to say, what I realized throughout this journey that I watched this, uh, the, 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 this friend of mine go through um, is that loss is probably one of the most ancient problems of humanity. It's been around since the beginning of time. There were uh, cave people who lost their, 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 their children or their wolf or their stone hammer. And with all of our technology, we still haven't solved this problem. And as I looked further into it, there was this um, case study of Japan where it's the one place in the world where everything that's lost is reunited about 80% of the time. The rest of the world, uh, things get reunited about 20% of the time. So I'm sort of fascinated with that. So I, I, um, I decided that I was going to try to end loss in the world uh, using an app. <laughs> Uh, we, it's been a few, few, few uh, decades after Japan had solved this problem, and they did it through creating a government institution and creating government incentives. So I, I, um, I decided to do it through technology and, and created an app uh, that, that initially was focused, has been focused on reuniting lost dogs, which it now does in seven American cities. Uh, about a year ago, we were named New York City's Dog Hero of the Year. The app's called Shadow been relatively fine under the radar, though we're now starting to, uh, to expand it and grow it across the country. So I split my time between investing, uh, running Shadow, and thirdly, I, uh, I started to give back. Uh, I care deeply about healthcare access, and I'm on the board of the Public Health School of Columbia, where I chaired our, uh, our uh, pandemic response committee. So literally during the heart of the coronavirus, um, we were involved in uh, uh, trying to help, uh, trying to help uh, people uh, get access to more testing. Um, there have been a lot of notes about different types of testing, different types of coronavirus testing that, that have been rolled out, a lot of which was not very specific and had a lot of false uh, negative uh, uh, test rates. And so we ultimately uh, had a test that was developed at Columbia by one of our star virologists, Dr. Ian Lipkin, that we wanted to uh, get funding for so we could scale it up. And uh, sort of in the darkest moments of coronavirus, you, you'd think the government funding would be available, but it was not. And so we needed to raise emergency funding. We ended up raising in a few weeks, uh, three, north of $3 million. A number of our day school classmates actually helped us achieve that goal. And that, that very test is now the standard, uh, one of the standards of New York City. It's becoming the standard of the LA school district. And it's by far the most specific and sensitive coronavirus test that I'm aware of that's out there. So I split my time between three pillars, uh, investing, uh, growing a new company, and uh, helping the Columbia Public Health School advance its goals. Let me ask you this question, Cyrus. Are we going to have a vaccine in the next six months? Uh, I have a high degree of confidence that we will, yes. You think so? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, the Moderna vaccine, as I have heard, uh, and I'm not a scientist, but I've heard uh, very promising things, and we will know by November if that vaccine is, uh, is going to be approved past its phase three clinical trial. Uh, I also, as I understand, the government has, of course, pre-purchased uh, vaccines for many of the manufacturers that are now in clinical trials. And so the manufacturing has already started. The key question in my mind is, uh, will, it, will it really change things back to normal? Uh, and it's not clear to me that that will be, uh, be the case for the time being, because I, as I speak to a lot of my friends, I'm not sure that they plan to give their kids the vaccines, at which point they themselves uh, will sort of change the way they continue to change the way that they live their lives. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if the next uh, year or two will be normal, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll get there as quickly as we can. You know, Cyrus, before I uh, came over today, I, I pulled our yearbook, your yearbook out, and I was just leafing through it. You know, this is my 
53rd year at the day school, but I also put 10 years before that in the public school. So this is my 63rd year of teaching. I've had thousands of kids. Some of them, many, many of them I remember. Some I absolutely have no idea who they were. Many, many, I forget their names. But if I see the face, I remember things like that. But there are always some in those 65 years that stand out. It's, it's, it's human nature for some reason. And you were one of those that stood out because I, I remember in your class, and, you were, and as a teacher, you remember some things 40, 50 years ago, and you never forget it. And yet you forget things from yesterday, okay? But I remember there were a couple wise guys in your class. There were a couple wise guys in your class. And yes. I remember they gave you a hard time here or there. They, were, they gave everyone a hard time. But you handled it very well. You handled it very well. And what, what impressed me about you in, a, in the class, if you remember, it was a tough class. It was honor. Yes. Yes. Honors English, you remember? Eighth grade, honors English. You had yes. to do 10 minute speeches. Yes. Memorize. What 75 lines? Do you still remember the 75 lines you had to memorize? All the world's a stage. All the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and each one in their time. Oh, there we go. I, I failed. I get mad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I remember how, and, and there were some very, very other bright people in that class. It was a real good honors class. And I remember how hard you worked and everything, and I realized that you worked your way into the end of the year. I don't know if you remember this, but you won the prize. You remember that? Uh, you mean this one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. You, yeah, you won the prize. I remember that. And I remember also, I don't know if you'll remember this, uh, Mrs. Greco, who passed away three years ago, God rest her soul, um, she spoke for you at commencement. Yes. Remember, she got together with Mrs. Tufanian. Yeah. By the way, I'm interviewing John next week. Okay. <laughs> Tell him I said hello, please. I'm interviewing John. But she spoke for you. I remember that. But you were always one of her favorites. You were always one of her favorites. She... Uh, Yes, yes. <laughs> in, our, in our fourth grade Thanksgiving, uh, we had a play, Thanksgiving Family Goes to Publix. And Public, I, her, Thanksgiving I wore, Publix. <laughs> yeah, I wore her, uh, her brown blouse. That was, I was the pilgrim father that showed up at Publix, and I, I, I was wearing Mrs. Uh, Greco's blouse. I remember that distinctly. And I remember she said after the assembly, the manager from Publix came to the assembly, came <laughs> saw the assembly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So anyway, what, what other what other things do you remember from the day school that you still every now and then will reflect on? And um... yeah, there's a. Um, I mean, who who can think back to the day school and not think fondly about uh, field day? Field day. Field day, right? And. Uh, um, Remind me, I think both of your children, both you and Mrs. Close, had were Pelican, uh, Pelican parents, right? Yeah, Lisa so, was Pelican captain. Right, so I'm speaking to, uh, to friendlies here, but I'm still very protective over the, uh, whenever I see day school people, I, I uh, meet people who went to day school, I always ask them the first question, Pelican or Flamingo. I still have a, a soft spot, spot in my heart for Pelicans, but, you know, I was never, uh, uh, I was a bit of a, a, a clumsy kid, so I was never really a great athlete, but my sister Lila was a fantastic uh, scholar and athlete. And she, I remember, um, I think I must have been in the seventh grade. Lila was a ninth grader. And Mrs. Bayless would, would always be the tabulator of the scores. And uh, uh, you know, I hope, uh, I, I, uh, God bless her, I wish she was here to tabulate the upcoming election. But you know, this is <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, I remember we had, uh, she was tabulating it and we were all looking to see how close it was and it was really, really close. And which meant that all of the, the final relays and the tug of wars were gonna, were gonna matter. And uh, the last relay they had was the, the co-ed relay <clears throat> and Lila was anchoring it. And I had so much high hopes that they were gonna win on this, um, on this uh, 
on this relay race and the, the race started and I remember someone had dropped the baton on the Pelican side and we were of course Pelicans and, and so they were far behind. They kept falling far and further and further and further behind. And then they got to the last leg and the Flamingo person had gone around and Leela got the baton and she was half a field behind. And I just thought there's no, I know how the score runs. There's no way she's going to make it up. And everyone just started chanting, Leela, Leela, Leela. And she basically took the entire field by storm. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think I've ever seen a human being move that fast. And she you was something. She was one of my favorites. Yeah, she really was. Uh, um, I mean, I uh, was very lucky to have a sister that was so gifted. Uh, but I remember like the best athlete, the best student, et cetera. And it was really, um, uh, I actually just admire, it was awesome just to watch her um, when we overlap. I, I very much uh, appreciated those times. Uh, my other fond memories, you know, I, I built my career on uh, technology and my love of technology. And I very much credit uh, uh, Mrs. Close and Mrs. Bayless for getting me, I remember my H plot, H plot, V plot uh, uh, diagrams that we were doing on, on the, old, uh, the old Apple uh, computers. And um, that was a, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I remember doing uh, so Mrs. Bayless got me into some additional computer stuff because I, I, I was clearly gravitating towards it. And so it really fostered some of my early, uh, my early interests uh, in technology. And it was actually in that very room that you are uh, right now in many respects was, uh, um, you know, uh, one of the um, instrumental uh, parts of my, uh, my, my getting started. Um, another memory that I had, um, you, you, you mentioned how, uh, how much, uh, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a few um, uh, hoodlums uh, perhaps in, in my class. Yeah, I remember we were in a sixth grade dance and um, I was just being my regular nerdy self and uh, started getting picked on and uh, that ended up becoming a bit more of a, a, of a tussle. And, and I remember you, uh, you, had, uh, you had us come outside and um, you very much, I had no idea that you knew who I was. Uh, and I remember, uh, you know, I hadn't had you for school yet. I remember you disciplined the person who started the fight with me and you didn't even look at me and you turned away. And I, I just thought maybe you forgot. And there's something about that interaction that perhaps, uh, perhaps you just didn't, uh, you know, you, just, you figured that, uh, you know, you were gonna come back to me later. And so for the next year, you know, I was just so, um, so like, ready for it. I thought you were just going to find me somehow and just like remind and, and, and give, give me a piece of your mind for, for, for messing up the dance. And so when I had you for seventh grade English, that was the, you know, the, the prize uh, that, that you referenced, the seventh grade English prize. I remember I, um, you had the vocabulary words written up. And I, at that point in my, my, my academic career, I, I was a decent student, but I was never like a top student, but I was so, worry that somehow if I messed up, you were gonna go pull me outside and, and, and give me a talking to about that dance. So I studied those vocabulary, I mean, I was always a math kid. The fact that I won my first prize was an English prize made no sense to me, but ultimately I was so afraid of getting a word wrong that I ended up uh, literally studying all day Sunday for 10 words. I would spend my entire day Sunday making sure that I wouldn't get a single question wrong on these vocabulary tests. And you know, that year, um, when I ended up winning that prize, it was the first time in my life that I'd ever won anything on my own. And it was the first time in my life that I connected hard work to positive outcomes. And my entire life, I, I remember um, my entire career at the day school, I, the one thing I was always just uh, wishful of is that, you know, I never had Peter Schuster's amazing athletic ability nor did I have Toby Earl's amazing intellect. And I had to work so damn hard for everything that I did. And the irony is that, that you know, and I just wish that I had one of those superpowers. And then that, that seventh grade prize connected for me. And it was the thing that made me realize that hard work would result in positive outcomes. And my entire life has literally been uh, derived from that lesson. And so uh, it is embarrassing if we haven't really talked about this face-to-face, 
uh, in the many decades after I've realized it, but I very much credit you, uh, and I, I say this with all honesty, with um, everything I've achieved in my life for basically giving me a formula for success. And so I, I very much, I can't, I can't thank you enough. So I well, appreciate thank you. this opportunity. Let me tell you one thing, Cyrus said, that work ethic that you talk about, that's all kick, that's all mixed in with one word. It's called character. You understand? Yes. You had you had character right from the start. Listen, it's been great. When's the last time you were in Palm Beach? I've been there. I was there uh, last year for the holidays. Uh -huh. uh, I've been uh, trying to avoid infecting my parents, so I've, uh, I'm not sure when I'll be back, but hopefully when everything normalizes. Listen, the next time you get back, okay, give me a call and I'll take you out to dinner. Okay. I would love that. I think my daughter, if my daughter lets me go to restaurants, that's. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, Cyrus, it's wonderful. It's so great to see you. It's so great to see you. And you're, as I said, you were one of the first we put on the list. <laughs> no, I get updates regularly, Mr. Greco. I will make the point uh, that I, uh, every time I'm in Palm Beach from now on, uh, you're okay. going to be my first. Uh, before I call Carlos Sanchez or Toby Earl or anyone else, I will call you. Okay.